start with the runway project. What are the challenges in virtual reality for fashion retail? In terms of clothes, sizing, we're not all the same size as that model we saw <laughs> in, in your, on your runway. How do I know it's going to fit on me? Yeah, so um, another technology that's coming along is body scanning. Um, we actually have contacts with some people who are working with uh, their own startups in body scanning technology. And as far as fashion and virtual reality in the future, I see that coming majorly into play. Um, when you have a full body scan of yourself, it's something you, you pay for. They give you an entire body scan that can be imported into your own personal avatar, so it's very lifelike. And then it has all these different points um, where your joints would move if the program requires it. So as soon as we have that readily available, I would imagine in the next couple of years, everyone would want to get their own body scan. And um, that way you have a more realistic representation of yourself. And then once these shops do come into bringing their clothes into virtual reality for their marketing purposes, um, you would try them on in VR just as you would in the real world. Thank you. All right, so let's think back five to 10 years. Uh, has um, augmented virtual reality progressed below or beyond your expectations? And follow up, um, has the adoption progressed below or beyond your expectations? So I'm starting oh, with you. Yeah, Mary let Beth. me answer that. Because, okay, so uh, I've been doing AR and VR research for 15 to 20 years. Um, so it's very exciting to me uh, that head mounts don't cost $20,000 anymore and that I don't have to have a backpack full of equipment to have someone uh, be able to use one of these experiences. So, well, I will say what has surpassed my expectations is that head mounted displays are back and uh, that someone suddenly everyone's excited about VR again because if you've been in the academic world, you know that we've been in this like VR winter. So in the 90s, everyone was very excited about VR. They go see Lawnmower Man and they're like, we're about to be transported into the holodeck. And then, you know, the, the technology couldn't quite meet what people were expecting. And then no one talked about VR for many years. Uh, but so it's very cool that it's back, um, especially as someone who does AR and VR. Uh, you know, we've been waiting for particularly the head mounted displays to get cheap enough that you could do this stuff for real and you could deploy it. We've been building crazy systems in the lab and testing them for 15 years. Um, and so we're waiting with the ideas and the data and the, the designs. Uh, we've been waiting to be able to make them real. Margaret, you want to follow up? Um, sure. The only thing that I would add is, um, you know, kind of building on what Mary Beth said is that, you know, there is this this new idea. It's actually not a new idea, but the idea of hyper reality, which really integrates augmented reality and virtual reality. So while augmented reality is limited by the perspective of the user, virtual reality is limited by its um, attachment to the real world. So we have this new opportunity with hyper-reality where we're, um, you know, bringing the two together. So we're really more focused on the industrial internet at CN2, but if you're, you know, looking at a piece of equipment and you've got the perspective from augmented reality, you might not see that the problem that you need to see is on the opposite side. So this idea of hyper-reality allows you to kind of elegantly move between the two and look at something from an augmented reality perspective, but then lift yourself above as though you're looking down from a gaming perspective um, from virtual reality and see that where you actually need to be is you know, on the other side and, and kind of move back and forth between the two. Real quick, I wanted to, because I thought I was going to get to come up here and say, who cares whether it's AR, VR? That was going to be my <laughs> provocative thing. Because it doesn't matter, like, those of us in the academic world, we can get hung up on that. But really, it's about, you have a spectrum from the purely physical to the purely virtual. And where are you going to dial your application in along that continuum? And it's like, how much of the virtual is being combined with how much of the physical? And it doesn't really matter whether we argue and sometimes people are like what's better I think VR is winning and I'm like winning what, <laughs> what? Um, yeah it's what's That's my next question what's cool is <laughs> that you know the digital information has been getting closer and closer and closer to us it used to be on a mainframe that we could only access you know through time slice processing and then it was on a desktop computer and it was only in our home and then it was on the laptop and it was on in our pocket in our phone um, and so it's just becoming integrated into our world into our bodies and our lives and however it's presented depends on what your needs are and who the user is. And then you just want contextuality that gives you just the information that you need right where you are right Slam when you need ball. it. <laughs>
And Annie? Oh, awesome. So, um, yeah, as far as five years ago, unfortunately, VR was not on my radar that much. Um, I've only become familiar and, I guess, learned much about it in the past few years, um, more recently the past two years. But um, I am very happy with where it's going and where it is right now. Uh, I mean, one of the major things that have made it so readily available is the progression of mobile phones. Just the fact that the screens are in such high quality. That's, if any of you did our demonstration back there, um, what's actually in the development kit from Oculus is a Samsung Note 3. So it actually is a phone in there, and as well with the Gear VR that he was showing, um, that's a phone. So the the more that technology has progressed, the more available it's become for the VR community, which makes it cheaper, which makes all of us happy. So, <laughs> yep. oh, yeah. I was supposed to mention Annie that uh, you are the Atlant Ten winner of uh, top ten young startups. So congratulations. Yes, we were in the top ten. Ooh, Thank nice. you. Nice. Yes. yes. All right. So uh, going going back on that. <laughs> all right. Um, next next question. Um, think. Um, tell me about military applications of virtual reality, Mary Beth. Well, so the military applications are always driving one of the big drivers of new technology. So when no one knew about augmented reality or virtual reality, you were getting funding from DOD and DARPA. And um, so fortunately, a lot of the innovations that we came up with you know, funded by, by the military are very applicable to all kinds of uh, domains far outside of the military. Um, I mean, there's kind of this holy grail that you imagine that, well, so one thing that's nice about a soldier is you can make them wear a lot of equipment. Like, <laughs> you know, if I tell Margaret, like, all right, you need to put a 10 pound backpack of batteries on, you know, she's not gonna do it. But she you, you can do that. <laughs> um, but uh, you know the kind of the holy grail is that the soldiers running around and it you know it's highlighting like the sniper is over here and the your friendly is over here and uh, so it there's a lot of grand challenges of AR and VR that uh, that are brought up in that in those use cases that we've been trying to solve for a really long time so thankfully it's good that there is military funding because otherwise there probably wouldn't have been any VR funding for. 10 years. <laughs> Annie? Um, yeah, so we've we've kind of started to get into the um, into with uh, federal law enforcement, so we're not actively pursuing development for them yet, but we actually are going down to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center on Tuesday, so um, we're going to be speaking to them about virtual reality technology, and one thing that they said they really want to hear about is um, the nausea factor of their current technology, so that's only going to get better as this progresses, but um, I know that uh, like military they need driving, uh, shooting simulations, flying simulations, all of those types of things, and they're just looking for the next best thing. So the fact that, as, as we said, the technology is becoming more portable, that's going to play a major factor. All right. Uh, 30, year go, 30 years ago, we shopped at stores where we knew the owner, received personalized shopping experiences. Unless you hire a personal shopper today, we usually don't get those kind of personal experiences in stores. Consumers are turning to online experiences for price, convenience, and personalized suggestions. Um, can we use AR or VR to help store associates provide more personalized in-store experiences? Margaret. <laughs> to give the unpopular answer. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, first of all, it depends on what you're talking about. Um, augmented reality offers the ability for you to have a digital twin. So if you have a product that lends itself to a digital form factor, then I think that this is a very, very powerful tool. So if you want to visualize whether a piece of equipment is gonna look good in your space, or um, you know, if, if something is going to fit in a particular parameter that you need to fit it in, then um, I think it's a very, very powerful tool, and it allows you to completely interact with a product, understand its options, usability, um, you know, space requirements, that sort of thing before making a buying decision. So um, in that context and, you know, also being able to look at the type of tools that like an Amazon offers where you can really refine a buying profile and, you know, bring products um, to a buyer that are relevant to, you know, the 
type of products that they're looking for, then I think that that is a very powerful tool. I think that there are other products out there that um, don't necessarily lend themselves to the medium um, and that you know some things are very very difficult to accomplish with the technology today it's not a, a solution for everything and so I think being able to understand the strengths and the um, restrictions of the technologies and you know being able to navigate that and present that in an elegant way is critical to a company's ability to have a successful deployment with utilizing the technology for productization. Any other comments, questions? Any other, anybody wants to answer? Uh, yeah, so I, I would concur with uh, Margaret. Like, uh, particularly, you know, think about the, like, I think of the reason I would go to Ikea. It's because I, you know, looking on the website, I don't quite get a sense of how big is that thing? Mm -hmm. What color is that paint? Like, how is it going to look in my living room? And you just want to walk in there and go, oh, that's way smaller than I thought. Or, you know, that door opens in a weird way that I didn't expect. So I think AR and VR is great for that sort of scenario, that to let you kind of compare it, you know, like, oh, it comes up to about here on me, or it would fit this way next to my couch, or, you know, be able to really look around it people are very terrible at navigating even a 3D model like on the web. You know, or so making the middle jump from 2D right. to 3D. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think it, there's a huge win and we can do that right now with technology that we have. All right. If you're if you're a budding entrepreneur in the audience here, uh, would, you develop, would you recommend developing in or for AR or VR and why? I'm gonna start with Annie. <laughs> Well, you know I'm going to say VR, <laughs> but um, no, I, I um, do have my reasoning though. There is right now, at least to me, such a lack of developers for VR. Um, we were lucky enough to go to Oculus Connect a couple of weeks ago, which was full of VR developers and it was just such a great community, but the majority of them are on the West Coast and there's not many people here. So um, that's actually one of the things that my group tries to promote as VR developers within Atlanta. So um, just because there's a shortage, there are so many Fortune 500 and other companies here that are looking to develop for this new technology and there, I mean, there's plenty of work to go around. So I would say VR is a really exciting place to be. Rebuttal, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, I actually um, just had a talk on this and I think that, um, you know, my opinion is that it, it, it really depends on what is the market that you're developing for. Um, if you, uh, I mean, I personally think we're witnessing, you know, the second bubble as Mary Beth um, stated for virtual reality. And I think that, you know, tools like Oculus Rift and, and you know, a host of others out there are really bringing that to fruition. Um, my personal opinion is that, you know, the greatest opportunities for VR lie in um, simulation, in gaming, and adult entertainment. Um, and <laughs> I had to say the controversial topic That's of the evening. It's the driver of all technology. <laughs> it is, absolutely. That's why we have, That's why we have the internet yeah. and VHS and a lot of other technologies. And so um, I think that, you know, there are the areas that augmented reality are going to drive, and that is really where it's relevant for superimposing digital content on the physical world for training, service, and sales applications. And I think, you know, equally as powerful are um, the areas is that VR will drive applications and again I'm a huge believer in you know hyper reality and the convergence of the two and that that will be the ultimately the most elegant solution. Mary Beth. It doesn't matter because we're talking about the same thing. Um, so what we're talking about is traditional presentation of content on a glowing flat rectangle versus the next generation, which is the content comes out of that glowing rectangle and it's in the world with us. Now, how much of that stuff is integrated with the physical world and, you know, th that all depends on what the application is. A lot of the technology is the same. A lot of the challenges are the same. Now, there are some differences. You only want to do AR if the physical world is important too. So if I'm trying to transport you to, you know, the Zerg base in StarCraft, maybe I don't need to be doing AR. Um, 
but if the physical world is important because I'm, um, uh, you know, you're doing some sort of task with a physical object or a physical person, um, then you you want to do AR. Now, you know, AR is hard because you've got to make the stuff align really well with the real world or it looks terrible. VR is hard because you have to invent a completely synthetic world. So there's challenges all around. I would say the skills that you have for one are really the skills for the other.